Wednesday, February 2nd, and it's the Just Baseball Show, but it's a different iteration of the Just Baseball Show. Peter, we got a special one, especially for you. We talked to Nestor Cortez today. Nasty Nestor is in the building. Are you kidding me? I told you, February 1st, the episode. We're not screwing around anymore now that it's February. We got freaking Nestor Cortez Jr. on the Just Baseball Show. Phenomenal interview. New month, new us, and we just had the most unreal. Like, we're supposed to frame it where we usually are like, we pretend like we didn't do it yet, but I'm like too excited that like we, it was sick and you'll hear in a second. So then our outro is just going to be us being like, wasn't that sick? So here's the <laughs> intro of us saying it's sick. You're going to love it. He's an awesome guy. Um, you know, we were struggling to get the schedules to line up and man, was it worth it to finally get it to, to line up because he's the nicest dude. He's so humble. And honestly, dude, like such in-depth answers on so many questions And you can see why he's successful now. Like the guy has just been a sponge from every person that he's had around him through the years. And I I think you're so right to talk about the kind of person he is even before the type of player, because he really is. I mean, after the interview, I just thought to myself, that was one of the most easygoing, easy to talk to people, not just athletes, not just media members that I've gotten the chance to speak with. But then on top of that, he's dirty. He's yeah. really good, and he's going to be in the Yankees rotation next year, and this was no fluke. We're going to talk about his pitch mix. We're going to talk about his mentality. We're going to talk about what he has to do to bring that type of success to Yankee Stadium every single day. And I have a feeling after you listen to this interview, you're going to come away with it thinking, wow, not only does he have the right head on his shoulders, but he's freaking nasty. And you're going to root for him too. His story is even more crazy. Just 36th round pick to get to where he is now. And there's even more that goes into it in terms of just climbing that mountain. And he still feels like he has more to more to go. So without further delay, here's nasty Nestor Cortez Jr. Well, here he is the man himself, Nestor Cortez. Nestor, thanks for taking the time, man. Uh, really excited to have you on here. I know Peter's even more excited and that's saying a lot because I'm pumped to be able to talk to you. Congratulations, first of all, on an insane 2021 season. And uh, how's the offseason been going so far, man? Um, first of all, thank you guys for having me. And uh, the offseason has been well so far. Uh, I took some time off uh, when I came back from the season. Um, had some vacation plans with my family. And, you know, now it's, you know, with this lockout, we're just, you know, I'm training down here, trying to get ready and see when, when there's a start date to go. And uh, have you heard anything about this lockout? I know it's just so tough right now because it seems like information is not get, being sent anywhere, but at least from a player's perspective, how's the lockout been treating you? Have you heard anything? Yeah. I mean, there's, there's been comments, you know, back and forth. Uh, we've been talking to our player reps. Um, obviously they, 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 they're being uh, keeping us on the loop, um, but it's just so hard because, you know, there, yeah. there's such a gap in between, you know, the, the PA and the, and the owners and stuff like that, that, you know, we, we don't know. We don't know where we stand still. I, or at least I don't know, um, you know, where where we, where we stand and what what, what report they were going to have. So you know, basically, we're just down here, you know, trying to get our reps in and, and, and stay ready, basically, because uh, in a normal in a normal year, we'll be reporting in about two weeks. Exactly. You know? yeah, yeah. To that exact point, <laughs> to that exact point, you know, how do you try to stay ready and get ready? Because I know sp- pitchers specifically. You know, they have their their regiment. I mean, you've been doing this for a while now. You ramp up going into spring training. How do you kind of uh, assess that? And how do you get ready to go given the uncertainty? You know, um, the COVID season really helped us, I think, uh, prepare for this right now. Because, you know, during COVID, we're like, you know, we would ask like, hey, should we, should we, you know, should we keep on doing what we're doing because we would act like if it's the normal season or should we not get so much workload in because we don't want to be tired, you know, when season does come or, or if it comes. So, you know, I think uh, this year I feel like players have more sense of what they can do and what they cannot do to, you know, kind of like not be so aggressive, but still stay, uh, ready to go because you know obviously we still have spring training to go once once you know there's a, there's a there's a date in our uh, in our calendar but um, you know guys guys 
it's hard. It's hard to stay ready. It's hard to keep that focus because, you know, you're so pumped about, you know, reporting mid February. And now it's like, man, we don't even know when, or when we're going to report. So it, it, it's hard. It's hard to stay mentally focused too. Yeah. It's incredibly hard to stay mentally focused. I can't even imagine during a period like this, but you're Nestor Cortez of the New York Yankees. And we have a lot of <laughs> baseball stuff to talk about. We have a lot of pitching specific stuff to talk about, but a story that kind of didn't really break the internet per se, but it, it definitely took the internet by storm in a way. So you and DJ LeMayhew adopted a turtle named Bronxy right before the series at home against the Rangers on September 20th. From that point, the Yankees went nine and three and found themselves securely in the playoffs. So what's the story with the turtle that brought life to the Yankees clubhouse? So I kind of went to the guys, obviously, you know, having, you know, Brett Gardner and DJ Mayhew and Stan and Judge, you know, all those big, big names. Um, I didn't want to be the guy to be like, man, why is this guy bringing a turtle in our clubhouse? <laughs> so I kind of went around the guys and, and you know, told Rizzo. And I told a bunch of guys uh, and I said, hey, what do you guys think of me bringing in, you know, a turtle? And they're like, uh, that doesn't sound so bad. But where are you going to put him? Like, what are you going to do? How are you going to take care of him? And I'm like, man, we'll figure that out as, as we, as you know, as the days go by. But I think we need something to like, you know, kind of, you know, camaraderie and, and have the guys, you know, come and, 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 and think the turtle's doing something for them. Or uh, I don't know, it's just, just a different feel. Cause we, like everybody knows we play so much competitive baseball and we get so caught up in, you know, the moment and, and, and the competitiveness. And I, and I thought it was a good idea to, you know, have something there to, you know, back off some or, you know, play with before the game or kind of, you know, relax and maybe, maybe somebody, you know, some of the guys even like to talk to the turtle, you know, and, and, you know, who knows what, what happened when, uh, when uh, they were alone, but, um, they, you know, I was happy with, I got the support from, from all those guys to, to you know, to bring in the, uh, a turtle and uh, for the first few days, we didn't have a name for it. So, and also I wanted to, you know, tell the team hey, like hey we got to come up with a, with a name but i don't like i don't want i don't want to come up with the name alone i want everybody to pitch in and i want you guys to give me what you got what, what's the best names and you know some some people said sort of different things and we're like well the best one is bronxy for now and and i think that that's what we what we got when we ran with it so two follow-up questions to that first you mentioned that it just had to be a turtle first I, my question is why a turtle not maybe a hamster or any other why a turtle specific well, I, that, that's a good question, actually. Uh, pe- some people thought about like a snake, and I, we're like, no, 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 no. we're, we're not. So we're doing going snakes. straight reptiles. No. We're not even thinking about anything cute like a kitten or a dog. It has no. to be. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, some guys were like, "Oh, I think a snake would be cool," but I, th- I thought the snake was a little dangerous, and and I don't think it was even legal to have one there, honestly. <laughs> um, and the hamster, I, I don't know. We just didn't think about it. I. Th- I probably just running around too much and turtles more like, you know, subtle and quiet and, you know, it just, it just lays it, you know, it just sits there and you just got to feed it and, you know, it gave us some sunlight. We, we read up on this. We, we, we knew what the turtle needed. We needed what we needed to do to the turtle, how much time I needed to be in the water. So we, we took it good care of it, honestly. And was there, was there a player who had a, maybe a special obsession with the turtle, maybe more than you might think? You said you were talking with um, Aaron Judge and Carlos Stan. Was any one of those guys, did they take the turtle under its wing in any way? Uh, I think the, the guy that mostly took care of it uh, was DJ LeMayhew and Anthony Rizzo. Those two so guys Rizzo. were like, yeah, there were two like, hey, have you fed the turtle? Hey, was the turtle, you know? constantly asking me about the turtle is the turtle okay and i go yeah man the turtle's fine don't worry about it <laughs> i'm not gonna kill this thing <laughs> uh but but no they 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 uh i think everybody once um it was in the clubhouse everybody you know even like aaron boone and and you know all, the clubbies the, the the guys in the kitchen they're like hey how's the turtle you know everybody every day when i came in asking me like hey how's the turtle i was like no the turtle's good you know it's just he's just there <laughs> That was one of my favorite stories of the year, just because it's fun to see you you talk about how serious baseball is all the time. And, you know, just to be able to add a little bit of fun and remember you're playing a kid's game and, and just enjoying it. And uh, the Yankee season, you know, you you guys finished really strong and that was a big part. And that was your performance down the stretch and really being able to 
provide, you know, a big bolster to a rotation that was beat up at times and being able to come out there and, and, and make big appearance after big appearance uh, for this Yankees team. Uh, how was this year for you? Because I mean, you've been a guy that's gotten a taste of the big leagues now uh, prior to that in three separate seasons, right? But the, the staying power of what you did last year and not only going to a guy that's sticking on the big league roster to being one of the most important arms on that roster. How did that all click for you this year? And, and could you just take us through your emotions of, of going from Seattle in 2020 to, you know, one of the ma- main guys, you know, getting outs in the Bronx for the New York Yankees. Yeah, I think it all went back to, like you said, my prior years, um, you know, those, those three cup of coffees that I got um, in those different years. Um, I think those three years when I came up, it, I was so starstruck about, you know, being in the big leagues and, you know, facing these guys and facing these big names and facing these, these big teams. Uh, I got caught up a little bit in like what I'm really, you know, what I, what my strengths are, which is go out there, have fun and pitch, you know, and, and compete. I'm a competitor, um, you know, and that's what I did in the minor leagues for five years, six years, you know, and, and my minor league numbers are really good because of that reason, because I just went out there and I, I, I showed you what I had. And, you know, at the end of the day, the best, the best was going to win. Um, and I think those three years, I kind of like, oh, man, I'm in the big leagues. Uh, I got to do this. I got to do that. I got to do this. I got to do that. And I didn't focus on uh, the competition and, and what I had to do to stay there. Um, and this year, I mean, I, I told myself during spring, uh, I knew it was going to be really hard to make the team out of spring because uh, I wasn't on the roster and stuff like that. So I told myself, hey, uh, I'm going to have a good spring. And whether I make the big league roster or whether I go to AAA, I'm going to keep competing and keep being me um you know and I told the guys hey I'm gonna grow a mustache you know once we go to triple a uh because it was allowed and you know some guys were like oh yeah well I mean I'll do it too I'll do it with you <laughs> and you know we're in Scram, Pennsylvania so it, n- nobody really cares what you have on your face um so and then after that you know once I got I got my shot um you know I thought I was gonna be sent down right after that game in Detroit uh, just because we were short on pitching. Um, luckily, the next two days, the starters went long, and I didn't have to be sent down to get a fresh arm up here. Um, and then after that, I just ran with the opportunity. You know, I got another I got another shot against the Phillies where uh, J-Mo, you know, got knocked out of the game early. And, um, and uh, you know, I, I, I pitched like, uh, I don't remember if it was like three, or two, three and two-thirds or four and two-thirds. Uh, but I know I, you know, I kept us in the game and, and, you know, not only for the team, but that was, you know, something for me to actually build on, you know what I mean? And, 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 you know, from there on, I just, I just took it as it came. And, and I I think I ended up pitching like, you know, 17 to 19 innings out of the pen and they were really, really good innings for me. And after that, uh, you know, starters went down and we needed a spot start here, a spot start there. And, you know, that's that's where I needed to lace them up and, and, and keep going. And, you know, I'm really happy um, that the guys down in the minor leagues helped me get my mind right and, and helped me develop. Because uh, I feel like I learned so much this year, not only about pitching, but about myself and my body and what I, what I can do. Um, because now I can go into this year knowing that I've done it before. Uh, you know, I, I, I can do it again. I just, I got to have the right mentality and I got to go up there and compete. And would you say, because you talk about, you know, the mental side of it a lot, you know, through, through what you were just saying there, uh, would you say with it clicking for you this past year, was it more of a mental connection here or was it also on the pitching side too, where you really felt like things just connected for you last year? It was a little bit of both. Um, I, I think I've always been, uh, you know, good mentally because of what, what, what I've said, you know, in the minors, I just said, Hey, I'm going to, I'm going to pitch to you. Here's my fastball. Hit it if you can, you know? So I think I've always been good in that part. Um, but like I said, in spring training, um, I got with the pitching guys, uh, you know, the coordinators, the minor league pitching coaches, the big league pitching coaches, the, the analytic guy, like we, we, we all sat in a room and I, and you know, they basically they showed me a slider uh, we rearranged my slider. We, we regripped my slider. Um, and it was, it was a huge pitch for me this year. Um, and I, I was able to throw strikes. I was able to get lefties and righties out. Um, 
And, you know, my fastball went up two or three ticks on the velo. Uh, so that helped also, uh, you know, and, and it all started in spring training with, with, with the guys that I was working with. And, and like I said, I took it and I ran with it. And I, I have a question too. So I read that Orlando Hernandez, AKA El Duque had a large effect on you when you were drafted by the Yankees in 2013. What has he meant for your development over the years? Uh, you know, me and uh, El Duque, we worked, uh, I want to say like two or three months together while I was in rookie ball. Um, he was like, you know, you know, he was like an advisor to the young guys, to the Latin guys that were coming from the DR, Venezuela, Cuba, um, you know, and I fell into that range where I spoke Spanish and, you know, I was able to relate myself to him because we were both Cubans. We didn't throw very hard. We don't throw very hard. Um, and you know, he, he's a guy that, you know, kind of reinvented his game as his career went on, you know, um, you know, and he saw, and he saw, like I said, my competitiveness and, and, and my willing to go out there and, and doesn't matter if I throw 89 or 97, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm going to try and get you out. And he kind of related himself with me for that reason. And he was like, man, I, you know, it's, it's, it's crazy that, that you've been getting a lot of outs, um, but you're not moving up in the system. And I'm like, I'm like, yeah, man, it's, you know, I don't throw very hard. I, I can get as many outs as I want, but if the velo's not there, I don't think, you know, I'll, I'll be moving up. And, you know, he was kind of like, uh, like, you know, a little bit mad about it because he thought that pitching was, you know, to get out. So it wasn't to throw hard. Um, so, so yeah, that, that's how we kind of like related. And, and we, uh, and, and he helped me out and, and, and made me, and made me think about my game more. And, and speaking about the velo, I have to ask you about the fastball because your fastball is quite honestly one of the wilder pitches in baseball in 2021 and wilder in a good thing. Your fastball held the hitters to an opponent average of 196 and you still threw it 43% of the time. It was a phenomenal pitch. But as the league trends towards added velocity, you've been able to be just so effective in the lower 90s. What do you attribute to the success of your fastball towards in a velocity driven league? I think the attributes that my fastball have helped me out a lot. Um, you know, there's, there's so many variables that, you know, I can sit here and, and, and go through and tell you, you know, I do this well, I do this well. Uh, I don't do this uh, quite as well. So I got to compensate, but um, I think you number one, it starts with, <laughs> <laughs> number, I mean, I, I don't think it's a secret. Everybody has those papers. You know what I mean? Um, but uh, I feel like, I throw a lot of strikes with my four pitches. Um, you know, I can throw it in, in, in any count. So it gives me that leeway where I can, you know, miss a little bit with my spots, but obviously not throwing 88. And, and like I said, this year I think was a lot better because I was 91, 92 consistently and um, 91, 92, my fastball looks like 95, 96, just yes, because nice. of my deception, you know, mm -hmm. yep. I'm 5'10", I'm 5'10", my arm size is a little, you know, low three quarters, uh, my spin rate is like, you know, high for what I, from my velo, so it's, it's so many variables, like I said, that it just complements, you know, the, the way I pitch, and, and, and I'm happy for it. <laughs> yeah, our, our analytics guy, uh, Kobe Olson, wrote this article on you back in this was August 7th, Nestor Cortez, one of the best four seamers in Major League Baseball. And, and he hit on a lot of those talking points. And this was published on our website. And one of the things was that your fastball has about two and a half inches less of vertical drop compared to the league average, which you talk about kind of keeping it on that level plane. It makes it seem like it's it's going faster. Another thing exactly. Disrupt, another thing that disrupts timing, though, is disrupting your own timing and your mechanics. But a lot of guys can't do that and throw strikes. You can it almost became like a funny thing to see. Like, what a Nestor breakout today. My favorite clip that I saw all year was was you messing with Otani. And this was like Otani at the peak when he's hitting a home run every third at bat. And Seriously. I mean, the yeah. guy's just terrifying. <laughs> and you're out there, you know, dancing mid mid pitch and, and got a strike in there. And he just couldn't even help but laugh. First of all, what, what was that like, that experience? Because you talk about getting acclimated to, you know, some of the big personalities. Obviously, you're getting out and you belong there, but, but that had to be pretty cool. And what made you start to just decide to just start messing with guys like that to disrupt the timing? when did you start trying that? Um, I start, you know, I, I did some, some stuff in high school, uh, nothing too crazy. 
And then once I got drafted, I kind of shut that down because I didn't know what the organization, you know, uh, was going to say about it or, you know, if they even liked it. Um, but once I started having success my first two years, I started, you know, I said, hey, I'm, I, I need to get out. I don't care what I do. I'm going to, you know, I need to get out. So I started doing some stuff and they're like, where do you learn that? I'm like, you know, I've always had it. I just never, I just never brought it out. I don't know. I, I didn't think you guys would like it. And, you know, I had a success with it and, you know, one thing led to the other and I'm here, you know, doing, you know, five trick pitches in, in a hundred pitch game. You know what I mean? So, it, I mean, it's not like I'm doing it every at bat, but here, here and there, I like to, I like to throw, I like to do some stuff that, that, that makes me unique. And if it's working, why not? You know, I would have to shut it down if it wasn't, I was getting hit every time I did that. Obviously I wouldn't be doing it as much. Um, but, but yeah, the Otani at bat was, was super cool. I think um, I had faced him the night before. So, and I got him out, uh, I think on a ground ball to second base with a slider or maybe an outside fastball. I can't remember, but I didn't do anything. And then the second night where he had seen me already the night before, I said, man, this guy, he's one of the best hitters in baseball. I'm not, I'm not going to, I'm not going to let him see what he saw last night again. Um, so I'm like, you know, if I get a strike one on him, on him, I'm going to, you know, do some, some stuff. And if I get strike two on him, then it's going to go like way down South and I'm going to, I'm going to do whatever I need to do. And, and that's exactly what happened. And, and I got lucky enough that the ball stayed inside the park with that fly ball to center field, but um, I was able to get him out. So I was, I was real excited about that. It's kind of cool that the rocket ship of Shohei Otani has nothing on Nestor Cortez Jr. That's kind of awesome <laughs> That's for you to say for yourself. But something I noticed through watching your starts this year, and I got to say, you're one of my favorite pitchers just to watch in all of baseball. You can probably find it on my Twitter when I'm just retweeting all your stuff. But watching your starts is the implementation of the nasty cutter, which you used a ton in 2021. And it was next to unhittable when you ride it into lefties at the plate and what it reminds me a lot of Nestor is Dallas Keuchel's cutter in his prime. When was it apparent to you that the cutter was one of your best pitches? You know, it's funny you say that because when, uh, obviously through my minor league career, uh, when I started with the Yankees, I didn't have a cutter. I know. Um, and, and I went, I went to the DR to play winter ball. And, uh, one of my good friends now, uh, the Spain, he's now in a uh, Korea pitching, but you know, he had a ton of, a ton of seasons here in the big leagues with the Marlins and the Padres and the White Sox. And he's like, man, why don't you throw a cutter? I said, I, I, I don't even know where to start. I don't even know where to grip it. So he, you know, he taught me a few things and I kind of picked up on it and, you know, the cutter is like a fast, but just, you know, with a different grip, like a, just to grip does the work. Um, and then in 19, when I was messing around with it, I was able to pick uh, CC Sabathia's mind about it. Um, and obviously, you know, CC is, you know, what he doesn't need a he he, he doesn't need a <laughs> introduction. Uh, <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, we, we kind of grip it the same, and and obviously he had to reinvent his game, and and his cutter was was one of his most dominant pitches, you know, when he wasn't throwing 97, and uh, and you know, I, I took that and. And this year, like I said, my velo went up on my fastball, so everything ticked up a little bit more too. So now my cutter wasn't wasn't eighty four, eighty five. Now it's eighty seven, eighty eight. You know, and that and that that played a huge role with with that kind of movement that I was having. That's pretty awesome because I mean, CC that that cutter really helped extend his career because he used to just blow it by exactly. You. But then exactly. he had to learn, you know, relearn a little bit how to be more finesse like. And, and that's that's pretty cool to uh, I would have never guessed that I would have never made that connection. That's really awesome. Um, yeah. So going all the way back, though, you talk about how you, you pick a little bit from each guy along the way. And I think that's a, a really common thing from you know players who are in your position is you, you be a sponge and you get a little bit from everybody going all the way back to high school at Hialeah High, uh, you know, in Miami, you were, you know, the same school at the same school as Gio Gonzalez, who graduated several years prior. He yep. would go back a lot, was very involved with Hialeah High. And that was someone that was a mentor to you as well, right? Uh, what did Gio mean for you early in your career? Because we're going to get into it. You weren't always a pitcher, really, until the end no. of your high school career. Uh, I was always a pitcher. I just didn't pitch in high school my first two years. Okay. Uh, number one, because, you know, baseball in Miami is a little different because we play year round and, 
a lot of guys get blown out, you know, by the high school coaches because of the competition and they want to win and stuff like that. So it's not the same of, you know, playing three or four months and blow, then blowing it out. You know what I mean? We play all year. So my dad was like, hey, you know, I don't really want you to pitch. I don't want you to, you know, hurt your arm. And, and honestly, at the time, I didn't think, you know, I was going to get drafted by anybody. I was just I was just playing baseball, number one, because I loved it. And number two is because I wanted I needed a scholarship because my parents couldn't pay for, a, you know, for a school. So but it all came, you know, to life when when Gio came and 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 I started I, start, I started I, I tried to do what Gio was doing in the big leagues in high school. Um, you know, to, to that one time we had that conversation. And I told him, man, I, I wish I could be like you one day. And he's like, he's like, don't, don't try and be like me. Don't, don't try and be Gio Gonzalez. Try and be Nestor Cortez. And, and, and it really stuck with me all the way because, you know, through minor leagues, I've, I've heard people say, man, I wish I was, you know, uh, Randy Johnson or Kurt Chilling or Roger Clemens, you know, and those guys are, are untouchable, basically. <laughs> yeah. You know, it, it's, it's really hard to be one of those guys. Uh, you just got to be the best version of yourself. And, and you know, wh- when he told me that, it, 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 you know, it just it clicked on me. And, and, I, and I stay with that, uh, you know, for the rest of my life. I'm going to have that for, for the rest of my life. And, and, if, and if I can tell anybody younger than me when they, get, you know, tell me one of those comments, you know, I, I hope to say the same. And, and just on that same point, do you have any other words of advice? Because we have a lot of high school players, college players, coaches that listen to this podcast. And you've just had such an incredible journey from high school now to the major leagues through so many different teams, so many different coaches, so many different amazing influences. Is there something that you wish you could have told your high school self now that you know? You know what? I, I, when I was in high school, like I said, when I was in high school, I had no idea what the draft was. I had no idea what a scout, what a scout was. Um I, I had no idea, you know, I, we just played the game because we played baseball. That's, and, and that's, that's how I, I, you know, going back and thinking that like, man, if I, if I pitched freshman and sophomore year, I probably could have prepared myself a little better to maybe throw harder or maybe, you know, have my, my pitches, you know, a lot better or command, you know, my secondary better. Cause out of high school, really all the high schooler has is a fastball. Yeah. You know, the, the, the high schoolers that get drafted, uh, you know, since forever, it's because they throw 90 plus, yeah. you know, it's not because they throw 83 and command their curveball. <laughs> so, so I, like, if I was talking to myself in high school, I'd be like, I would, I would, you know, I would, I mean, there's guys getting homeschooled right now and, and, and going to the gym at 9 a.m., you know what I mean? And then going to a physical therapist at 12 and then going to their baseball practice at three. So, like, that, that's serious right there. You know, and when you when you're a kid that has a lot of promise, you need to you need to focus on those things, obviously. You know, but like I said, I, I didn't have that, and I didn't know my parents didn't know either. It's like until until I met Gio, and Gio kind of like led the way, led the way. And once I got drafted, you know, he kind of told me how how things were done and how things need to be uh, for me to get to the next level. You talk about getting drafted. You were selected in the 36th round out of high school. And uh, at w- what point did you decide to you know, potentially sign and go or go play in college and continue to build yourself up? Because you started pitching more at the end of your high school career and I started pitching more and more and, and showing you know, that you could do this. Because uh, as far as, as I, I know, because my, my uncle coached you in high school, you were an, a right fielder for a lot of the time, right? I mean, like you, yep. you played – you probably thought you were going to hit in college, right? I mean, at what point did you realize you were going to pitch in college? And then when did you decide maybe, okay, I should sign and go play pro ball. I have a follow-up question in regards to this too, that might catch you by surprise. Um, so, so like, yeah, like you said, I, I played right field and hit first uh, my four years of, of high school. Um, and it wasn't until my junior year where I started pitching, you know, for the high school, I was pitching, you know, travel ball and, here and there and 16 and under and 15 and under, but um, I didn't start pitching to my junior year. And that's, you know, junior year, I was, I don't know, 82 to 84, topping out 85, 86, maybe. And then uh, senior year, I started working out, uh, you know, not for baseball, just because I, you know, I wanted, wanted to feel good and look good. Uh, Cause I live <laughs> in Miami. Yeah, obviously. <laughs> and, um, and, you know, one thing led to the other and I got stronger. My legs got stronger. 
my arm got stronger and and I went to a showcase I remember in 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 fall of my senior year um and I topped out 90 I'm like wow this is inc- like I I couldn't believe it and and then scouts were handing you know my dad uh, like you know those letters they give out to your questionnaire to fill out to, to know about you and know more about you and stuff like that and and you know when the regular season came around I was like holy crap there's there's scouts in my games you know there's there's people with like radar guns every time I pitch you know I had seven eight ten twelve scouts out there every time I pitched and I'm like what's happening um and it wasn't until then that I realized that like Okay, maybe I could be a two-way player in college, you know. <laughs> <laughs> An Otani of yourself. Yeah. Be yeah, exactly. Exactly. So I actually got the scouting report from Carlos Marti that I know is someone that was really important to you too. And I'd love to hear some thoughts on on you know yeah. his impact on you. Uh, but Carlos Marti, you know, at the time was who convinced you know the Yankees to take you in the draft. And one of the things that stood out the most to me, not only that he was spot on about everything about you um when it says level of confidence in this report he said and i quote i would put my house on it obviously you know you go back with marty and and i mean what does it mean to you to hear that from carlos marty former scout of the yankees that he would put his freaking house on your success and again i mean he would have had two houses now so pretty darn cool. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, he followed my high school career. Uh, he knew I was a gamer. He knew, um, you know, I knew how to win. Uh, you know, I was a first batter. I, I would, I would hit. I would play right field. I would, I would play first. I would play set. Like it, it didn't matter where you put me. I, you know, I was gonna, even if I wasn't really good at it, but I, I was going to try my best and give my best. Um, you know, and I and I appreciated that 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 he went out on a limb and and, and on and, and said that. You know what I mean uh, about me, because uh, it speak it speaks volumes. You know, and 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 I remember that day like it was yesterday. We went we went to Tampa, and I I went to throw a uh, live PP the last day of <clears throat> the last day that a player can sign with it, through the draft, which was July twelfth. The, the the draft was the sixth, the seventh, and the eighth, I believe, and you had a month to decide whether you were going to go to college or sign the professional contract. And I waited to the last day to go to Tampa and uh, sign that contract. And, uh, you know, everybody was, I, you know, I was, I was a high schooler facing minor league guys and they were all late and they were all, you know, miss hitting the ball and hitting foul balls and stuff like that. So, you know, these guys, I feel like they got to give a lot of credit to Carlos Marti because of that reason, because, uh, you know, I, I showed up and, and, and I, I, I made him look good, you know, <laughs> <laughs> I love that. And and just fast forwarding to some of your success in the big leagues. And the reason I want to talk about this game is because I watch Yankee games all 162. And this specific game on September 15th against the Orioles, I thought was one of the best pitch games by any Yankee in 2021. So you, Nestor Cortez, went six and a third, three hits, one run, 11 strikeouts. You were freezing hitters with 93 down middle. You were throwing backdoor 88 mile an hour cutters that were perfectly placed. You could throw the slider wherever you wanted. You got multiple strikeouts on a sidearm fastball. But Michael K described the game as a microcosm of the season, as the Yankees ended up blowing that league lead, but then capped it off with a bloop single from Brett Gardner to win it in the ninth. How did that start feel for you? And do you agree with Michael K that it was a microcosm of the season? You know, looking back at it, and I, and I said, I don't, I didn't realize how many strikeouts I had, you know, through the fourth or through the fifth. You know, I knew I was striking out guys. Obviously, I'm not gonna be like, hey, oh my god, I didn't know I had, you know, eight strikeouts through four or or whatever the number was. Um, but I didn't know I had, uh, you know, nine or ten or eleven strikeouts, you know, through six. Um, and I went out for the seventh, obviously. Um, but yeah, I mean that that game was was incredible. Uh, like you said, the, they they fought back, they tied the game. Um, you know, we were able to come out on top, lucky. Um, and yeah, I mean, he was fought on. You know, it was it was incredible. That that I feel like that this was September fifteen. You know, we needed every single game to be won. Every single game that we had, we needed a win to yeah. to 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 make the playoffs. You know what I mean? 
imagine, Absolutely. imagine, imagine we don't win that game. We're we're now we're sitting in that in that 163 game, you know, playing uh, Toronto, I think it was, or or Boston, whoever whoever played that 163. Um, so it was, you know, it was it was super important. Every game from that from that point on was super important. And and the reason I ask is just because that seemed like your entire repertoire from the sidearm fastball to the slider to the cutter to everything. It was working in harmony, varying leg lifts. You were doing the entire you that was the Nestor Cortez Jr. show. So that's why I wanted was there like a mentality switch? Was there anything different in that game? Because you've had other great games, but it just seemed like that day on September 15th. You were at peak performance, and when Nestor Cortez is at peak performance, there's few that can hit you ever. Yeah, I mean, yeah, uh, I feel like everything you know clicked. Um, we had a good game, game plan going forward, uh, you know, before the game, obviously, and I think uh, you know the catcher called a great game. Uh, I think I didn't shake as much as I usually do, um, and that led to you know a, an incredible, an incredible night. Um, Hopefully, I can have many more, many more of those in in the future. I bet you will, for sure. <laughs> and a little bit more on just like pitching in Yankee Stadium it, it is a little bit of a unique challenge in itself. You got a lot of space in center. Obviously, it's a little bit shorter down the lines, and you're a guy that likes to throw the fastball up, you know, and get swings and misses up there too. How, how do you juggle that? You know, getting the fastball up, trusting the fastball up, while also not leaving yourself susceptible uh, to, to the long ball a little bit. Yeah, you know, I, I was kind of getting worried about that um, when I was starting uh, because I was giving up a lot of home runs. I was giving up a home run every single time I started. Um, but luckily, there were only either one run home run, like it was solo home runs or, or, or you know, it would be like a walk or a base hit and then a home run. So it would only be two. Um, so I, I, I started asking questions. I'm like, hey, what do you guys think of me giving up a long, the long ball every single time I started? They're like, well, let's look at it, you know, game by game. You know, what have you really done wrong? So we started, you know, going in, you know, diving deeper into our, our start, my start. And they're like, hey, we're okay with you giving up a solo home run. You know, solo home runs are not going to, are not going to beat you. You know, we still got to score to win. So, so that, ca- that kind of kept me at ease. And, and, and I knew that I couldn't walk anybody or, you know, limit the base hits because I was susceptible to giving up the long, the, the long ball, you know, at any given point, because like you said, I, I, I was throwing up in the zone. Um, so I, I had to keep my game in check, you know, in other ways. So when I went to my strengths, um, I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't, it wouldn't be as, as hurtful if, if it, if it did go out of the park, you know? So moving on to the playoffs, um, unfortunately, the Yankees got kicked out in the wild card game. And for me, watching the Yankees lose to the Red Sox was about as gut wrenching as possible as a Yankee fan. The Yankees had just swept them in Fenway 10 days prior. I was really confident about the game, but how was it in the dugout and the locker room after a loss as substantial as that one against your better rival? Yeah. I mean, our season ended that night. Um, I remember us being in the bullpen cause I was in the bullpen that night just in case, uh, you know, something, something weird happened. And, and, um, you know, we were all quiet back there and, you know, once the later innings came on and I mean, we, we, we were still hopeful, but, uh, you know, when you're down th- those runs against a good team, it, it's hard to come back, you know, a- any team, you know, really. Um, and I remember going inside that locker room after the game and, you know, everybody was just sitting at their locker and, you know, everybody was quiet. Um, Aaron Boone came out of his office, uh, kind of gave a, you know, gave us some words and, and, you know, he was thanking us for the season that he had. And, you know, we, we, we fought adversity the whole year. Um, I think, you know, it's, it's not a secret. Everybody knows that, uh, guys were hurt. Uh, you know, we weren't playing to our level. Uh, we were pitching and not hitting, or we were hitting and not pitching. You know, we were just, everything wasn't clicking on all cylinders. Um, you know, we kind of had, those uh you know those those stretches where we won 15 games and then we lost 12 you know so um it was hard it was tough it was tough for us to 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 swallow that pill and and you know every, then everybody else you know 
kind of like the uh, the captains of the team, you know, like the guys that you you always heard when they talk and you always listen, um, you know, like the Garrett Coles and the Stanton and the Judge and, you know, Brett Gardner, you know, we didn't know what, what his future, st- you know, would stand. And, and, you know, those guys, obviously, they know the game, you know, as as good as anybody else. And, and to hear those guys, you know, talk in front of the locker room after a big loss uh, with, with, with the season ended, you know, it was, it was tough. It was tough to hear it and it was tough to look up and it was tough to look at them in the face and, and, and accept it, you know? Um, but it's something that, 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 you know, you learn, you learn, you learn and, and you try and get better at and, you know, just hope for next year, it, you know, it doesn't happen the same way. And building off of that, you know, how much did you learn in this past season being around those guys, uh, playing for a team that you know, went through a roller coaster and, and you know, finished strong and then comes up short? Uh, the combination of that experience on top of your performance, I feel like you probably learned more in that year, uh, in that half a year, really, than maybe several years prior to that. What did you take away from that? And how do you apply that into 2022? Uh, as we get ready for this this next season, yeah, uh, I was lucky enough to um, to be in the dugout for the second half of the season because uh, I was a starter, um, and to listen to those guys, like the pitchers, you know, uh, obviously Jamo has done it a long time. Uh, Jordan Montgomery has been really solid for us. Uh, Garrett Cole, obviously, is you know Garrett Cole. Yeah. Um, he's <laughs> yeah, he's all right. <laughs> and and you know, you guys, you guys, you you had guys like Michael King, Domingo Herman, you know, these guys that that we were just talking in the dugout about, you know, through the game, watching the game, we'll be like, hey, w- what do you got in this pitch? What do you think? What do you think is coming now? And I would throw this, I would throw that, and why? And hey, why would you do this? And hey, why would you do that? So we asked a lot of questions amongst ourselves. And, and it, it, it made me, it made me realize, you know, there's other ways to do it. There's not, there's not one way to get out and not one way to pitch in the big leagues. Um, and it was super cool. It was super cool to just be there and, and talk to those guys day in and day out and, and, and compete with those guys. Because even like the hitters, you know, I, I the hitters will come in and, and you see them, you know, fighting for their lives out there in the box, you know, they're, strike by strike ball by ball they're they're competing and, and you see it in them where where they're down 0-2 on the count and somehow they come back 3-2 and they win the at bat you know it's it's huge to see that because you're also you're also rooting on for your hitters and and, and hitters like to see the pitchers inside the dugout you know rooting for them and, and 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 being there for them so I thought it was a really cool experience to be in the dugout and and I learned a lot um in that in that form where where there's so many avenues, you know, that you can go through to, to, to win a game or to, or to get better. And, and it was just awesome. And hopefully next year, uh, you know, I make the team and, and, and I'm there again and, and, and we're fighting, you know, to, for another championship season. And there are so many leaders in that Yankee clubhouse. I mean, we talked about Brett Gardner, hopefully he comes back, but you go down the line, Aaron judge, Garrett Cole, like they're just rolled his chat. Like they're just guys in this locker room. Who of them do you feel like you're picking the brain most? Like which which pitcher or maybe even a hitter are you going up to more more often than others? And not to say that you wouldn't go, but just the guy that you feel like you're always bouncing things off. Well, I was lucky enough to be with Brett Gardner um, in the dugout, uh, and he is. It, it was it was like a chess game with him. Uh, and he and every time he played and every time he got on a bat, you can you can feel and you can see when he battled through the at bat, and it was incredible to see. I, I it's he's one he's one of the most players I respect, you know, because Brett Gardner, you know, it's gonna be he's gonna be the fourth outfielder this year and ends up playing 140 games, or yeah, you know, somebody gets hurt and he ends up playing you know 130, you know, uncalled for, you know what I mean. Um, so, so being with him in the dugout and, and asking him questions and, and him, you know, he, he would go up to me and be like, hey, do you think that was right? And I go, 
I don't know. You tell me. <laughs> yeah. He's like, you know, he would go, he would, he would take me through the process and, and it was super fun to, to, to hear him, uh, to, to, to know his point of view of the game. It was super cool. Yeah, that is awesome. I mean, that's a guy that's been around that's played with not only the, the big stars you talk about on the team now, but he's played with some, some dudes through the last decade. Um, and he has a ring on the roster he with a, a ring. ring. Yeah. He's and, the only guy on the exactly. roster with a ring. Exactly. Or at least so, Going yeah. off of that, I mean, what's it like to play for such a historical franchise? I mean, I, I know any any of us, anybody, and I know you'll say the same thing, right? Like playing for any major league team is incredible, no matter who it is. But the Yankees are the freaking Yankees. And I'm only going to say this when a Yankee is on the podcast. Peter, don't Thank get you, used Arm. To it. I appreciate you. Yeah, don't get used you. to it. It took, <laughs> being, it took a Yankee being on the podcast for me to say it, but it's the freaking Yankees. I, do you feel that? when you wear the pinstripes, like, is there just a different like aura there uh, compared to, to wearing another uniform? A hundred percent. You know, they're so big on, you know, tradition and they're so big on, you know, who has, who has walked these, these halls and who has sat in your, this chair that you're sitting at. Um, and it's cool. It's cool to like, it's cool to know and, 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 and to try at least, you know, to be half of what those guys were, you know what I mean? Um, it's crazy to think, it's crazy to think that, you know, 22 years ago, I was watching CC as a, you know, eight-year-old or nine-year-old pitch for the Cuban Indians. And then I was in 2019 sitting, you know, in the same locker room as him. So it, it's, it's incredible. And, 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 and from a pitching standpoint, you know, when, when you got two strikes on a hitter, you know, the whole stadium will stand up and start clapping. And if you got that strike three, you know, everybody's roaring and, and it's, it's, it's an incredible feeling. You know, you don't hear anything during the pitch, but once, once that pitch is over and and, and you have, you know, that positive outcome, it, it's, it's, it's a feeling that's, uh, it's unexplainable. Unexplainable. I love it, man. And I, I have, Five, maybe six, just rapid fire Yankees questions for you. You ready? Go ahead. All right. Number one, who is the strongest in the weight room? Uh, we all know that. <laughs> Actually, do, do we know that? There's, there's, there's competition. There's That's competition. what I'm saying. Do we know that? There's competition. I, I would say, I, hands down, the strongest. And hopefully, you know, the other guys I don't mention don't get mad at me. <laughs> but I think, I think, hands down, Aaron Judge is the strongest human being. Ooh. But I wrote this Chapman and 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 Stanton and Voight and yeah, Voight. Uh, like I, that's I what I'm go, saying. There's I like could go six down of the them. Line. <laughs> yeah. I could go down the line. But but uh, uh, the strength that Aaron Judge has is is impressive. Um, but like I said, there's guys that get after it in there. So who's the fastest? Oof, the fastest uh, this year. Just who's the fastest teammate you've seen in the Yankees in the in the locker room? Who who would win in a race right now in the 2022 roster if they all raced? Oh man, uh, shit! Is it Wade? Uh, Wade Wade is really fast. Yeah, Wade is really fast. Wade uh, from the guys that I've seen with the Yankees, Wade, Greg Allen, uh, Cameron Maven, uh, Brett Gardner is still pretty fast. Yeah, uh, I mean, but Wade Wade is definitely the fastest in that like, in that roster. So I have a small story to tell you. So, uh, and this will lead into the next question. So I used to work for the New York Yankees in their season ticket sales department. I worked there um, from about 2019 to 2020. And um, I was watching batting practice one day. This was back in 2019. And I'm on the top deck, like tippity, tippity top up there in left field. Doesn't get any higher. I'm sitting there in the front row of the uppermost deck and I'm watching batting practice, right? So no one can see me. I'm way out of the realm of possibility of any ball going near me but no Aaron Judge hit 120 rows beyond me I thought it was the farthest ball I've ever seen hit anywhere ever in batting practice it was unfreaking believable so is the question is the answer to my question is who hits the farthest home runs in batting practice is it Aaron Judge still or I mean Giancarlo Stanton is also Giancarlo Stanton yeah. It, it's it it's 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 a t- it's a tough question because they both I think they both hit the ball as far 
They both. Really? <laughs> it's like maximum I, human capability. Also, Gary yeah. Sanchez hits nukes. Oh, yeah, that's another one that's like, yeah, he doesn't look as like he, you know, he he has his muscles, but he doesn't look as strong as these guys. And this guy, he has like stupid strength, you know, like it's like incredible. Awesome. He yeah. kills baseballs. I mean, yes, just watching batting practice at Yankee Stadium with the Bronx Bombers is almost better than the games, I have to be completely honest with you. Yeah, I mean, the, the pitchers barely have to shag out there, you know? Uh, every ball goes over the fence. So who, who's, <laughs> who's who's the funniest in the locker room? The funniest? Uh, Kyle Higashoka is a funny human being. Really? <laughs> and, and, and Brad Gardner is a jokester, so... Those are the two guys that 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 uh, Kyle's like more sarcastic, funny. Gardner's more like he's gonna prank you, funny. You I know? love that. So, <laughs> who who's a player on the Yankees to look for as a breakout player? Because we're doing a lot of bounce back breakout players for twenty twenty two. Who's a guy we got to look out for? Um. Well, I, I, honestly, I don't really know what the final roster is gonna look like, but um, I think. Uh, whew, well, we already know Jonathan Waisiga is the truth. So. He is the truth. <laughs> well, I mean, that's good, a good answer, though. Truth. You said, like, this yeah. guy could turn into top reliever, one of the top relievers in the game. Oh, hands down. There you go. Hands I mean, that's down. the answer, I think. That I mean, the guy, could, the guy could be a closer, I think, anywhere else. You know what I Seriously. mean? Seriously. Yep. Yeah. And, and, and what he's done well, – I mean, he's always – you know, last year he was really good and 19 he was really good, but this year was like, wow. You know, like this guy's this guy, this guy was this guy this year was like the Tommy Kangley of 19, you know, thought he's better. Yeah, he was. I, I think he was better. He was way better. Which is saying, but, a lot. you know, saying a lot. To, to, Tommy Kangley was really good for us. In oh, he was so good, too. Yeah. <laughs> so and, and, and to see you to, to see low, you know, turn that switch and, and, and finally, you know, finally become who he really is. It's, it's incredible to watch, but I think also, uh, which is no secret. Clay Holmes is, is unreal too. He's also the, you truth. know, and so last, last rapid one from me. Is it true? You still ride the subway to games? Yes, I do. And I will continue to ride the subway. <laughs> I love that, man. It's, That's it's, my favorite. It's thing the ever. easiest it's the easiest way to get there. And after the games, you don't got to wait 45 minutes in traffic, you know? Dude, I mean, I, you might be wearing a mask, maybe so it holds over the mustache, but how do people not recognize you? Well, I, I mean, I look like a regular person. I'm 5'10", <laughs> you know? I, I don't got the biggest muscles in the world, so uh, it, people don't know who I am, you know? That was and I cover be my, my face. That was going to yeah. be my question is, you know, obviously your life – changed pretty quickly in 2020 i mean you were big leaguer and that that's a big change as it is but when you're a, an impact big leaguer for the new york yankees things change even more uh, how much were you getting recognized and how how weird was that for you uh you know during this season and over the last year yeah i think i think people were obviously you know the mustache yeah. was giving me more of a character um, because I never, if I didn't have a mustache, I, I would, I would look like any regular, you know, person walking in the street. Um, but the mustache kind of gave me an identity and, and, you know, I was going to restaurants and I was going, you know, on the subway sometimes without a mask and, and I would forget like, oh man, I got to put a mask on because I don't want anybody to recognize me while I'm on the subway, you know? Um, so it, it was just, it, it was cool to walk around and be like, Hey, are you, are, it, they wouldn't even say Nestor Cortez. They'd be like, Hey, are you nasty Nestor? <laughs> <laughs> As they and should. I, I love that. And I'm like, and I'm like, I'm like, yeah, yeah. He's like, oh, you might take the picture. I'm like, yeah, of course. But it was, it was cool to get recognized, you know, in New York City, you know, just walking around, you know, at, at noon through, through Midtown. You know what I mean? It was, it was, it was awesome. It was a good feeling. Last, last one from me, best spots to eat around Yankee Stadium or in New York City that you always tend to go to. I know you're a Miami guy, new to New York. Where's the best There's, food there's. You, you know, actually, I was riding the subway one day, and there's this billboard uh, or this poster on the wall. And I can't tell you the exact numbers right now, but they said that if you ate in every restaurant in New York City, you, you would have to eat. You would have to eat for, I think it was like 75 years or 80 years. Yep. Breakfast, lunch, and dinner to be able to eat in every restaurant in New York City. So That's the craziest stat I've ever heard. That's a that's a tough question. That's a tough answer to give you of, of what's the best place to eat in New York City. Your personal but, favorite, though. But but my favorite, my favorite, 
Um, I really like I really like um, Tao, and I really like STK. Those are you know what like obviously there's more steakhouses and, and there's more sushi those places are the nice to go to, but um, those two places are you know when when me and the wifey want want to go out and get a bite, we 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 definitely go to those places there. That's awesome, man. I have one more question from me, maybe two. Sorry. Um, when, That's okay. <laughs> we're taking BP every once in a while, probably very rare, very, very rare, um, given that you guys are in the American League. Have you gotten a chance to see all the pitchers swing it? And where do you stack up there? Would, would you say you're the best hitting pitcher on, on this staff? No, no. Uh, I think um, with JMO being in the, in the National say. League, he, he can swing it a little bit. Um, and honestly, when I was there, we didn't play any. We only played one National League team. Uh, t- it's actually two, the Marlins and the Phillies. Um, but I didn't really see Herman can swing. Herman can swing. Uh, <laughs> Jamo was <laughs> J- better than Herman, uh, but still still down at the bottom of the list. Um, I'm probably right there, too, with them. I, I, I can't. I used to swing in high school, and I thought 85 was really fast. So I can't imagine swinging off a guy that throws 97, 98. So I'm, I'm way off. I'm way down that list. Have you been, have you been in contact with Luis Severino? How's he doing? I know he's coming off an injury. You know, a lot of Yankee fans are expecting a big year out of him. Have you heard good stuff about Luis Severino? I'll tell you what, what we saw at the end of the year from him was incredible. And, yeah. and it was fine. You know, Severino's a superstar, you know, he, when he's healthy, he's, he's an all-star, um, and it, it sucks that we haven't we haven't had him on the field for the last you know two three years, um, and we kind of got like a little bit of him this year. And hopefully next year he's he's super healthy and and you know he's a guy that's gonna be right there with Garrett Cole. You know, uh, not taking anything away from Garrett Cole, but Luis Severino is that good. That's just you a know? testament to how good Luis Severino can be. That's not a detriment at all. We all exactly. know what Garrett Cole can be, but Luis exactly. Severino can also be that dude. Yeah, he I, Luis Severino is a superstar. Wow. You guys, I mean, everybody knows that when he was healthy, he was the guy. Yeah. He's electric. Yeah. I mean, they were talking, like, who do you give the ball to? You know, like, game one. Like, who do you give the ball to? And then Sevy was yeah, – I mean, yeah. I mean, the answer. Uh, Derek Cole's pretty good. Yeah. No, well, I'm saying before, before the Cole era. Before the Cole era. Yeah, that was the yeah, – Well, 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 Garrett Cole, well, Garrett Cole pitched a wild card. If he would have won that game, Severino probably would have had the ball, you know, or, or – Or mean, you might have had the ball. Or me or, or J, J – uh, uh, Jordan Montgomery oh, was 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 also pitching really well too. You know, he he. I think he had a stretch where he gave up like one or two earned runs every, every time he started. You know, and that's super 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 good. So, yeah. I mean, the the starting pitching were, were was was really good, and, and and we held we held our place. So hopefully we can do that again next year. Well, well, that's the amazing thing because this American League East is just ridiculous offensively. Fact. specifically it's it's just dumb Insane. i mean the blue jays the rays the red Sox, uh, those the guys, orioles the orioles are the a good orioles can team. hit too the orioles can swing the orioles it are a good hitting team yeah what do you think the key is for you guys you know t- to be able to get over the top next year and, and win the division and also uh two-parter to wrap up here what's nestor cortez's focus going into next year to build off of what was a phenomenal 2021 I think team wise, uh, you know, like like I said earlier uh, he, here, um, we gotta be clicking on all cylinders. You know, uh, you know it, there's gonna be games where you're not gonna hit, and you're gonna you're gonna have outstanding pitching, and that's gonna you know help you win that game or that day. And there's gonna be days there where you know our pitchers are gonna get up seven, but we're gonna score ten. Uh, you know, that's that's it's just part of the game. Um, but I think I think when when we're at our best, and obviously that you know every team can say this, but with the pitching that we have and 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 the that lineup that roster we have, I mean it, it's it you got to go out there and 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 you know get in a dogfight every single day. And as for me, um, you know, hopefully I can continue what I did last year. Um, I'm gonna keep working hard. I'm gonna try and better myself uh, command wise and pitch wise. Um, I want to throw a little harder. I want to keep throwing. You know, those ninety twos, those ninety threes. Um, if there's more in there, I'm going to, I'm going to let it eat, <laughs> but, um, just give it a, a, a chance, uh, for my team to win. And, and, and that's all you can hope for, for, a start, for any pitcher, not only a starting pitcher, but as a reliever, you know, hold your part and, and hopefully you give your, your team a chance to win.
and your arms feeling healthy, you're feeling good for 2022. I'm just excited, man. This season's gonna be awesome. Yeah, yeah, I feel great. Hopefully, uh, we can get this deal going and see what happens and 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 get to spring training. It's awesome. Yeah, man. Thank you, you man. so much. We're with you, man. Nestor, thank you so much, man. So much fun talking to you. Uh, glad we were able to make it happen and looking forward to watching you this year. Uh, we'll be rooting for you. Even me. Uh, I'm not the Yankees fan, but I, I'm t- only rooting for the Yankees when when you're on the bump. Rest of the time, uh, <laughs> not as much. Don't but, worry, uh, we'll get him. Nestor. Nestor will be with we'll you. Convert. Yeah, he'll get there. He'll get there. <laughs> but thanks so much, my man, and best of luck this year. No, thank you guys for having me. Like I said, we should have done this a long time ago, but I'm happy we we got it done and and hopefully uh, ne- we can see each other next year. Definitely, man. This is awesome. You're this year, actually. Year. <laughs> well, Peter, I got you, Nestor Cortez. We got Yankees. a big thank you. Shout out to my uncle. Shout, Shout out Shane, your uncle. Who coached him in high school. And uh, I mean, just unbelievable. Unbelievable to like, it, watching him emerge last year and, and everything, you know, that he was on the mound, but also just like the enigma, the nasty nester, the mustache. The fact that he still takes the freaking subway. I didn't even know that, dude. Like you had some of those, like those questions that only Yankees fans would know. Like, <laughs> I didn't know he still take. I don't even want to take the subway sometimes. Like it's a little scary. This guy's taking the subway. He's a Yankee starter. That's what I was saying. And it was funny when I, I, I spoke to him about um, when I was working at the Yankees, that story about Aaron judge and the batting practice, but working outside the stadium, like I saw guys like Chad green chasing Shreve back in the day. Some of these guys legit walk past the entrance where fans are and just walk right into the stadium and nobody has any idea who they are. So people working for the Yankees still don't know who they are. I'm like the only one standing there and be like, yo, that's Chad Green walking in. And people are like, who? And I'm like, what do you mean, who? You're at a Yankee game. You don't know who Chad Green is? So that's why when I ask the question, because Chad Green, Chase, and Shreve, well, if you've ever seen them, they kind of look like regular white guys. They kind of look like me. Yeah, you know, yeah. just blending in. One of those, you know, just those kind of guys. Nasty Nestor, the mustache. He says he's 5'10", and he, he you know... He, he, he doesn't have these huge muscles, but I'm like, out of all the Yankees, you might be one of the most recognizable. That's why I was so surprised that he still rides the subway. I know, especially on the pitching staff side, aside from like Cole, he's definitely like, he's distinguished and it's like, so who cool. do you think is more recognizable him or Jordan Montgomery? Jordan's just so tall. Yeah, true. Him or like Tyone. Yeah. Him, right? Like, I think he's yeah. more noticeable than Jamison Tyone. I agree. And, and you know what? Like he was, he was as good as anybody in that rotation. And, and just so cool to hear uh, this guy dominated last year, uh, you know, like through a lot of different stretches was really darn good. And I don't think the Yankees don't make the playoffs without him. Like they don't make the playoffs without him because when he came up, they needed him most. And he, and he really came up big Um, still so humble and so hungry. And I think that's what really has us excited. And I'm sure you're really excited Pete as a Yankees fan with how hungry this guy is to keep getting better after having such a phenomenal year. Dude, he had a two nine ERA in 93 innings last year, struck at 103 guys and had a 1.08 whip. He was just a really phenomenal pitcher. And that's the story here. This is not a player who came onto the scene and the whole Bronxy thing. This isn't just some fun guy. This is a legit starter. Yep. For the New York Yankees in their rotation playoffs. And I wasn't kidding when I said, okay, if Garrett Cole, if they win that start, who's starting game one, maybe Nestor's not starting game one, but he's starting a game. He's coming in. He's like this is role. a legit pitcher and not just in 2021, as we move forward, he's still a young guy. I'm really excited for what we're going to see from the him next year. I, I am too. And, and beyond that, definitely going to be rooting for this guy moving forward and a guy that hopefully we'll be able to uh, get on the show again, you know, as we get into the season and, and keep going, keep moving forward. I would love for nasty Nestor to be a uh, just baseball show regular, but regardless, so awesome to be able to talk to him in this episode. And uh, Peter, any final thoughts from you? All you got to do is go check out some just baseball merch in the episode link of this description, get your t-shirt arms rocking it right now. Hoodies. It's getting cold people. It's getting cold. Get yourself a hoodie. Get yourself a hat. That's all I really got for you. But you are writing up the Nestor Cortez interview for JustBaseball.com that will be dropping, if not 
the day of listening, at least by Thursday, we're going to write up the entire Nestor Cortez Jr. story beyond the podcast because as much as we like him as a player, the story of how Nestor Cortez became Nasty Nestor is phenomenal. Yeah, there's even more to it, and I'm really excited about that. You know, even from quotes from the scout who signed him to, you know, my my uncle who coached him to teammates and everything in between, it, it's going to be a really interesting read, even beyond the interview, um, even though he gave us so much in that interview. But, man, was that fun. Uh, I, I can't wait to just – have him on hopefully again and root for him through the season. And Peter, I mean, the good news here is that he just made me a little bit more of a Yankees fan, a little bit Yankees. more of a Yankees fan. Yankees 22, 2022 world series book it. Thank you everybody.